Uh, my name is Nuan Daz and I'm a technical lead at WSO2. So my main area of uh, focus at the moment is on the research and development activities uh, of the WSO2 API manager. Um, and this session, uh, I'll be talking about the extension and customization, uh, customizability of the WSO2 API manager product. So uh, let me, before going into detail, let me explain uh, why this session has been put in place. So um, you being a, a, a someone looking to uh, host an API management solution in your organization. And uh, I'm pretty sure that you would uh, need your API management solution to suit your business uh, needs, their specific or unique uh, requirements, uh, security restrictions, uh, deployment architecture rest restrictions, uh, likewise. So with all those requirements in place, and if you're trying if you're looking for an API management solution off the shelf, the chances that you'll find something that suits your organization on a perfect fit are very less. So it's pretty important that you uh, understand the capabilities of extensions, the, the, what level of customizations are possible in the product. Right, so to start off with, I'll give a very brief introduction into the major components of the API manager. So you must have heard about this uh, during various sessions. So the API manager has four major components called the publisher, store, gateway, and key manager. The publisher, as its uh, name implies, is where API designers and publishers would come and design the APIs, attach the necessary policies, and publish them onto an API store. And the API store is where application developers would come in and discover APIs, register themselves and the applications, and start consuming the APIs. That's about it on the API. Uh, publishing and discovery part. The next is on the API uh, hosting part, the runtime part. The runtime part is taken care by the gateway and the key manager. The gateway serves all your requests. It uh, validates your requests against the policies that have been set with the assistance of the key manager. And so the product and the platform has a lot of extension points. Uh, the extension points we are going to look at today during this session are these sets. So we are going to talk about uh, security extension points, uh, message mediation policy extensions. We are going to talk about workflow extensions and the changes that are happening to the lifecycle executors. And we are going to talk about branding the API store and publisher. And I'll also introduce you to a new API that we are building for the, for the product itself and give you an introduction into the source repositories uh, of the product. So starting off, uh, we'll look at the message mediation uh, policy extensions. So uh, when an a request is received on an API of the uh, gateway, it is sent into a channel called this in sequence. Why we call it an in sequence is because uh, you can configure a sequence of actions to be performed on the message when it is inside this channel. And the same story applies for the response path as well. It is going through a channel called the out sequence. So this diagram illustrates a very basic scenario where the API gateway acts as a simple proxy, uh, routing a request and back a response. Uh, in some cases, you'd need to do something more advanced, where you'd need expect a request in a particular format, transform it into another format, and the same applies to the a response path as well. So in this case, you're getting a request in JSON, you convert it into XML, and the same story applies for the response path. So to do these kinds of things, you need a certain policy to be applied on your message in both the flows. So how you do that is by uh, having a message mediation policy which acts as an extension to the in sequence and the out sequence. So this uh, extension uh, sequence or policy will do or take care of your uh, message transformation or dynamic routing requirements uh, and similar kinds of uh, requirements in particular use cases. So uh, this is a kind of UI that allows you to uh, select those policies. So at the time of designing an API, it allows you to, to select the policies from a predefined set of uh, lists. Uh, and you can select in which flow to apply them. And these policies are defined in a, a configuration language called the Synapse configuration language, which is available on the ESB. And this box down here give, uh, gives you a, a, like a sample configuration. So it's uh, based on XML uh, at the moment. Then uh, from uh, sequences, uh, message mediation policies, then we move into handlers. So each API has a set of handlers that are executed in its request flow and in its uh, response flow. So actually, when a message is received on the gateway, before the message is handed over to the in-sequence or in-channel, it goes through a predefined set of handlers. 
So as you can see in this diagram, it goes through a set of handlers and then goes into the in sequence. And it's the same sequence of handlers are executed in the response flow as well. The good thing about these handlers is that you could have your own handlers in there. You could write your own handlers, or you could choose to replace one of the existing handlers with one of your own, or you could even remove handlers that you think that you don't want. So the handler mechanism is a pretty extensible architecture. So for example, if you think you don't want to do OAuth for your APIs, but you want to do basic auth instead, you could take off the handler that does the OAuth part and replace it with a basic auth handler. Yes, there are consequences in doing that, because you need to think of how the subscription applies, how the throttling applies after that. But that's for a separate discussion. So in general terms, you can replace any existing handler uh, with a replacement, uh, suitable replacement. So the handler sequence is defined in each API. So uh, this XML on each API defines the sequence of handlers. Uh, the generation of this uh, XML is governed by a template uh, called the velocity template file. So that particular file, you could find it in this location in the product. So this, this is based on the Apache uh, velocity templating engine. So if you want to introduce your own handler into this list, or if you want to replace one of the existing handlers with one of your own, this is the place to edit. So you can go and uh, play with this and inject your handlers uh, as in, uh, how you want it to. Right, then we come into an interesting part of extending security. So Prabhat has been talking a bit about security. So, and he mentioned that in the API manager, our primary mode of security is uh, OAuth 2. So uh, API manager, uh, and as you know, OAuth 2, uh, it operates on an access token, and there are different mechanisms of getting these access tokens. Prabhat talked uh, about them in detail. And the good thing about these, access, uh, these uh, mechanisms is that you could extend them, you could customize them as per your requirements. We'll talk about that in detail. And one thing we did uh, uh, in the last feature release on the API Manager was uh, we allowed uh, plugging in an external OAuth server into the API Manager. So if you already have an existing OAuth uh, server in your organization, you could use that instead of using the API Manager's uh, key manager. And like I mentioned before, there's also the capability of replacing the security handler with your own uh, security handler. So we'll go into a little bit of detail on these. So when, when dealing with access tokens, depending on the nature of the applications that you use, uh, depending on uh, how much of a control you have over those applications and their security, etc., cetera, uh, the way you get access tokens is different. For example, for trusted applications, you would provide your user credentials to the application and exchange it for an access token. In certain cases, you would just use the application credentials to get an access token. So these depend on how secure ap applications are uh, and how much of a control you have <coughs> over, these, over those applications. And uh, you might very well have a case where you want to implement a custom uh, grant type. So each of these types is called a grant type in the OAuth world. So you could have a requirement where you have want to have an entirely new mechanism. So one example could be if you, if you have the API manager deployed internally and if you are in a position to trust all the requests that are coming into the API manager and you really don't want to validate, uh, you don't have user credentials in the first place and you, even if you do, you don't really want to validate it. What you could do is you could get the source that's sending the request to the API manager to sign a particular uh, JWT or, or some kind of string and based on the validity of that signature, you could issue an access token. So that's a custom grant type where you trust the signature and issue an access token in exchange. So that kind of a, th th that's an example of a uh, custom grant. So uh, you could write th that grant and plug it in into the uh, API manager. So if you're implementing a custom grant, the class to look out for is this abstract authorization grant handler. And the method that you want to look out for is this method called the validate grant. So the validate grant method receives all your request, uh, the parameters in a, a request message context object. So that method can do all the validations of your request parameters and return true or false based on the validity of your, uh, of your uh, logic. And when you define a grant, you could just package it in a jar and put it into the lib directory, and you would configure it in, this, uh, in the identity XML file under this section called the supported grant types. So you could go in and provide the name for your grant and the name of the class that implements that particular grant. Then in the last feature release of the API manager, we introduced this capability of plugging in an external OAuth server. So why did we do that? 
so if you already have an OAuth uh, provide in your organization, you could utilize that instead of bringing in the uh, WSO2's identity server or WSO2 uh, API manager's key manager. So we know that bringing in an authorization server into an organization uh, is not an easy task. It needs to go through a lot of approval, et cetera, et cetera. So if you can utilize what you already have, that will that will save you a lot of headaches, and yeah, so it avoids introducing the need for having to introduce a new authorization server, and it also avoids you having to mi do migrations. If you already have applications registered in your system, you could use those and avoid migrations to a new authorization server. What that mean means is that it would keep your clients intact, so you don't have to change the code in your clients that does the uh, necessary parts of getting an access token. So your clients could remain intact. So these are some of the benefits of utilizing your own auth, OAuth server instead of bringing in a new one. And if you are Im implementing uh, or extending or using your own OAuth server, there are two interfaces that you have to look out for. So in the context of the API manager, there are two components that interact with the key manager. One is the API store for registering your applications, and the other part is the API gateway for generating access tokens and for validating access token. So the key manager interface is used by the API store primarily for registering your applications, uh, getting application credentials likewise. So if you're having your own OAuth server, you need to provide an implementation for that particular interface so that the API store can work in collaboration with your OAuth server. Similarly, uh, for the gateway to collaborate with your OAuth server, you need to provide an implementation for the, API, uh, the key validation handler interface. So that interface defines the uh, methods for validating access tokens, uh, etc. So this would be the request flow uh, that will be in place if you're using uh, an external OAuth server. So under, num under number one over there, you, you have the incoming request to the gateway. And the gateway will call uh, the key validator. So this key validator could be external, or it could be inside the gateway as well. For clarity pur purposes, I've taken it out. And it's actually this key validator component which will talk to the external OAuth server at step three over there. And the that OAuth server will tell you whether the access token that it received is valid or not. After that step, the key validator will do some of its own checkings to do further validation. For example, to check if you have a valid subscription to access the resource, et cetera. So it will do uh, uh, some, some of its validation on its own, and then give the response back to the gateway saying whether your request is good to go or not. So this would be the uh, request uh, flow when you're using an external uh, OAuth server. Coming into workflows, so on the API store, there's capabilities of plugging in different workflows or controlling different user actions. So some of them are the user sign up, application creation, API subscription, and key generation. So you can plug in uh, different controls of these particular user actions. And these workflows are an extensible mechanism. So we have a, a class for each workflow called a workflow executor. And the workflow executor sits on the API store, and that's the one who is triggering all these workflows. So the workflow, we ship some default workflow executors, and one of them is a workflow executor that triggers a particular task on our business process server. So the workflow executor on the, that's sitting on the API store can trigger a business process uh, or sitting on a separate business process server or any other service. So, the, uh, so if you want to like have a human task involved, a user interaction involved in these particular workflows, you would need to uh, define that in a business process engine and have and have in a workflow executor inside the API manager, which, should, which can talk to a particular business process engine. So sometimes people get confused since we ship this particular approval uh, in, a, in the business process server, how they can modify the workflow uh, process. So uh, they tend to get confused when and where to uh, modify it. So like I said, it's the workflow executor that's operating on the store, which triggers an external uh, workflow. On, on the on the business process serve. So if you are okay with the data formats that is being going out from the API manager and the amount of data that is going out, and you only want to change like the approval process, or you want to add more steps into the approval process, uh, or you want to have a separate approval process, then you only need to worry about modifying the business process that's sitting externally. If you are happy with the data that is being passed from here, from the API store. 
But if you want the data formats to be changed, if you want uh, their structures to be changed, etc., or if you want additional information to be passed, then only should you consider uh, having an internal workflow executor. So, for example, if you want to simply send an alert uh, when an API subscription happens and do nothing else, you could only have an internal workflow executor and send an alert and return without having to, uh, having to worry about modifying any external uh, sources. Then we come to an interesting part of API lifecycle executors. So all this time in the API manager, uh, we've had a, a, a lifecycle that was pretty static. So we really didn't consume the uh, registry lifecycle that was available in the platform. And due to this fact, uh, the steps in the lifecycle were pretty static. And you really didn't have a lot of control over what you could do uh, when you are moving from state to state. So now in the next feature release of the API manager, something we are doing is we are um, <coughs> using the registry's lifecycle executor. So what that means is you have complete control of your lifecycle execution. So if you want, you could introduce new steps into your lifecycle. And even more, you could control what happens when a particular straight, uh, state transition happens through lifecycle executors. So what that enables you to do uh, in addition is it enables you to have a kind of uh, API development governance. So if you want to have an API that's you know, being created in the first place, then published into dev, and later published into QA, and finally published into QA uh, production, you could define like these lifecycle steps uh, into the API lifecycle and make sure that they are promoted accordingly and demoted accordingly. And even more better, this also allows you, gives you a control of what happens when you publish. So if you want to say publish to an external gateway, you could do that by controlling what happens in this lifecycle executor. So, so we've had requests coming in from customers saying that they already have their gateway in place. So how can I use your portal to publish to that? So we have different mechanisms of doing that, but moving forward from the next release onwards, the most straightforward way of doing that would be to use this lifecycle executor. So now, if you think about it, uh, if you think back a, a few minutes ago, I mentioned about having an external key manager. And now I'm saying that you could publish to an external gateway. And we also have the capabilities of publishing to an external store. So what that means is you could use the API publisher as a central API governance portal for publishing your APIs to an external store, to an external gateway, and you also have the capabilities of using an external key manager as well. Then coming into branding, so the API store comes with uh, 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 some branding capabilities, the store and the publisher apps. So you would be interested in doing uh, some you know, UI changes or to make the store and publisher have the look and feel of your organizational uh, themes. So you could change the branding by uh, editing a few template and a CSS files. So the web apps, the publisher and store web apps are st both stored in uh, this location called the server jaggery apps uh, location. And under the store, if you look at the second bullet point here, under the store site uh, themes directory, you would, file, you would find the template and CSS files that you need to edit to make the store look like uh, what you would want to. So uh, the CSS and the themes would, uh, the template files would allow you to get the look and feel of your application. And so if you, what you could do is you could, there are several options that you can go for. If you just want to change the look and feel and the logo and the colors and stuff, you could just live by editing the CSS files only. And if you want to change the order of things as well, how they are displayed uh, and their formats, etc., you could override the template files by using this concept called the sub-theme. So what a sub-theme is, it's a copy of the main theme, but with a different name. And you could specifically override certain files by having them in the sub-theme. So whatever the files that you have in the sub-theme will override the files in your main theme. So the good thing about that, uh, having a sub-theme instead of editing the main template files is that it will help you in product migration. So if you're uh, <coughs> deploying a newer version of the product, you could use the same sub-theme in the new version of the product as well without having to worry about the existing file changes. So if you change a theme or use a, use a new sub-theme, you would have to change a configuration file, which is the uh, site.json file. And you would have to provide the name of your sub-theme 
and if you provided a new theme, you would have to provide the name of that uh, new theme as well. So these are some UIs that I just mocked up uh, for, for the presentation. So this is one of them. And then you have another which has changed the colors and logo a little bit. And as you know, the API manager is uh, multi-tenanted by nature. So each tenant gets its own store. So and now in the API manager, you also have the capability for each tenant to upload his own theme into the product. So the API store is a collection of uh, a lot of tenants' stores. So each tenant could log into their own store. Uh, and if you're an administrator, you could upload your tenant's theme into the API manager and each tenant store which would get its uh, look and feel of each tenant. So this is something that's uh, pretty important for uh, API Cloud as well. So it's the same concept that is being used, or same product that is being used in uh, the API uh, Cloud. So, and the API Manager also has a set of APIs that are exposed and consumed by a web application. So, so there have been certain like customers who have consumed these APIs and build their own UIs on top of our uh, functionality. Um, so what we are doing in the next release is that we are coming up with a completely new RESTful API uh, in re replacing the existing API because the existing APIs that we have are like not as good as we want them to be. So the new RESTful API we are introducing conforms to the Richardson Maturity Level 3 of uh, REST API design. So that will be out in the next feature release of the API Manager. So we really encourage uh, community feedback. The design of these APIs uh, can be found in this particular GitHub location. So it has all the API documentation in place. And all the discussions related to this API is happening on our architecture and uh, dev mailing list. And the product source is on GitHub. So if you want to contribute, uh, you could go into GitHub, and under WSO2, you would find two repos called the Carbon API Manager APMGT and the Product APIM repos. So, uh, if you're interested in building, you would first go into the Carbon API Manager repo and do a Maven clean install, which would get all the working state jars into your local M2 repo, and then go into the Product APIM and do a Maven clean install to build the product distribution. The product distribution will then uh, go into this particular uh, target directory. So in terms of community, uh, we have a Jira uh, in here. And we've seen customers sending us few PR for bug fixes and in certain cases for features as well. So we really encourage the community to do that. Uh, so please, if you fix something, send us a PR. We'll review and merge it. And so this, you could subscribe to these two mailing lists and follow our discussions on API Manager and on other aspects of the platform as well. So like I said, the API Manager, uh, I only covered a portion of, uh, of the extension point. So my main uh, idea objective was to give you an idea behind our thinking of how we think about features and uh, design them and architect them. So there are a lot of other extension points available in the product, like you could if you're familiar with JWT, you could customize the JWT token generation. And we also have a feature now for grouping and subscribing, uh, grouping applications and subscriptions. So you could customize how these are grouped. Uh, are they under roles? Are they under permissions likewise? And we also have a capability of publishing to external stores. So by default, we publish to the WSO2 store only. So you could also use it to publish to an external store. And we also have the capabilities of overriding and extending uh, the data publishing to our analytics platform. So by default, we only publish data to analytics platform. And we also publish to Google Analytics. So using a similar approach, you can use it to publish to any other sources as well. And there are other, uh, lots of other extensions coming from the Carbon platform itself, such as the user store manager extensions, the authorization manager extensions, the registry handlers, etc. So there's a bunch of other extension points uh, available in the product as well. So that's it from me. <laughs>